Welcome to Three Devs and a Maybe. Now introducing your show hosts, Michael Budd, Fraser Hart, Lewis Keynes, and Ed Mann. Hello and welcome to another episode of Three Devs and a Maybe. My name's Ed Mann and today we're very lucky to be joined yet again by Scott Arzuski. How are you doing, Scott? I'm doing great. How are you? I'm very good, thank you. Listening back to last episode, I'm having to cut it into two parts, actually, just because we had so much good content there and I just kept you for way too long. And I know you're a very busy man. Um, but one thing in there, actually, that you said was about digital signatures. Uh, and it was like, you know, maybe we could talk about it in another episode. And uh, for the audience and for me, this is the other episode. So no, thank you again, man, for taking the time to come on the show. I really appreciate it. Yeah, happy to be here. Awesome. It'd be great maybe to kick off the show. As something you see in encryption kind of bounded around, what's the difference between symmetric versus asymmetric encryption? So I wrote a blog post, I think it was like two years ago at this point, uh, called You Wouldn't Base 64 a Password. And the idea was to introduce the common terms and concepts of cryptography. Nothing super like in-depth, like uh, LLL, you know, lattice stuff, but with the basics, the stuff that as a developer you're going to use on a day-to-day -day basis. And I broke it down into three main categories. One was uh, keyless, which is hash functions. One uh, symmetric key and then asymmetric key. Key, you know, a hash function, you take a message, you get put it into it, and you get a fixed length output. It's pretty useful as a building block by itself. Maybe not the best thing to use for most protocols, like for authentication or password storage. Symmetric encryption, you start with a key that... You know, the person who encrypts and decrypts uses the same key to encrypt a message to where only somebody who possesses that key can decrypt it. Asymmetric encryption is when you have um, a key pair, a key you keep private and a key you keep that you uh, give to your other participants. And they'll use that public key to encrypt a message, and then only you can decrypt it. And there's different ways to achieve this. Um, you can either encrypt the message directly, which it turns out is actually a very bad idea, especially if you have a long message and you're using something like RSA to do asymmetric encryption. Uh, or you can encrypt it with a symmetric scheme like AES, and then uh, use RSA to exchange the key. Like you encrypt your AES key with your RSA public key, and then the key's encrypted, so the person who has the private RSA key can decrypt the AES key to decrypt the message. And the terminology gets a little bit muddy there, but that's a step towards the uh, current best standard for doing like uh, public key encryption. And then you have a completely different approach, which is what uh, Lipsodium does, which uses um, uses a thing called Diffie-Hellman, which is normally used for key exchange. And this is the uh, crypto box seal function. If you follow along uh, with you know Lipsodium usage, what it will do is it will encrypt, it will generate a like one-time Diffie-Hellman key, uh, which or sorry Diffie-Hellman key pair, which is a secret key and a public key. Uh, it'll do the key exchange algorithm with the recipient's public key. Encrypt the message using a derived shared uh, symmetric key, and then it'll just append uh, or prepend the public key that it generated for that one-time key pair to the front, and then it sends the rest of it as a normal ciphertext. And then the person who has that uh, long-term secret key can decrypt it. So the itty, the nitty-gritty details of asymmetric encryption can get really hairy. I've also seen some weird things in the post-quantum uh, domain, like some of the multivariate and lattice-based systems. I haven't studied them well enough to speak confidently about how they're implemented, uh, but there's uh, there's different ways of doing it. When it comes to uh, building cryptography into an application, asymmetric encryption is the one you're most likely going to make mistakes in. So if you're uh, building like an encrypted chat application, you think, oh, I'll use uh, RSA and AES and that'll be fine. Um, you might want to hire a cryptographer to look at your code before you deploy it. <laughs> With symmetric keys, then, am I right in thinking that both of them need to know the key to actually unlock, or you should say, unlock the actual the secret? Uh, and it's finding out how do we actually transfer that knowledge. If I lock it with this key, I need to give you this key somehow. Obviously, if I go through a public network, someone could eavesdrop on that and just get the key. So asymmetric gets around that where you're just passing out essentially in this kind of, if you look at the analogy of like locks, you pass out open locks that people can lock and then give to you, which you only have the key to open. Mm-hmm. It's like a wax seal on an envelope, uh, except in this case, if you uh, seal the envelope, nobody can open it unless you have the right thing to... It, there's no real good real uh, like physical analogy to asymmetric cryptography. Public and private keys, you only... Am I right in thinking that you only decide which one of those is actually private? Like, you can interchange the two, can't you? 
No. Um, well, you can technically, but uh, it's really ill-advised. If you take the private key, which is your secret material, you can generate the public key in like uh, microseconds. But going the other way around is an extremely slow operation. So, for example, if I give you a random 256-bit uh, secret um, and say, you know, use this as a, uh, you know, curve 25519 private key, you can generate the public key by, just by using that as an integer and multiplying by the base point. Yeah, adding the base point to itself enough times using a ladder construction, it gets complicated. <laughs> so then you get your public key. But to go back from public to private, the reason that, these, uh, that this is secure is that you can't go the other way very easily. Uh, and then you have, you know, other properties like for... Curve 25519 for doing uh, Diffie Hellman. Me and you are trying to communicate, and I take your public key and my private key, and you do vice versa. You have my public key and your own private key, and we multiply them both together. We'll get the same shared secret. That's how Diffie Hellman works. Uh, there's a good YouTube video that explains it using uh, paint mixing with secret colors. Yeah, asymmetric cryptography is a lot of fun. <laughs> But this is exactly it because you know talking about digital signatures and then rsa and things like that was definitely something you know in the last episode we kind of brushed over so following on with the asymmetric encryption like what is a digital signature um a digital signature is a cryptographic assertion that a statement is authentic like it was signed by a person or an entity that possesses the signing key uh which sounds kind of vague and abstract but basically what it means is that you have a secret key it could be you know 256 bits of it's like you know, an elliptic curve. It could be 2048 bits if it's RSA. But it's private and secret, only you know it. And then everybody else in whatever protocol you're communicating over has your public key, which is derived from your private key. And you can take your sign, you know, your messages, whatever you want, trying to sign to them, uh, and you can use them, uh, a digital signature algorithm of your message. And through some magic that I can get into in a second, you'll get a signature that you can pair with your message and send them both. And everybody can inspect it knowing your public key and say, yes, this came from you. So how this actually works, and the reason I said technically a minute ago was with RSA, you know, you encrypt with your public key, you decrypt with your private key. Uh, you actually do flip that a little bit. You uh, technically encrypt a hash of your message with your private key after doing some padding like OAEP or PSS. And the other person can use your uh, public key to basically decrypt the hash and compare it to the message. And if it compares, then it's the correct signature. But I don't advise anybody do that themselves unless you're designing a crypto library, in which case you already know all the pitfalls you need to avoid. Yeah, because I was watching something last night and it was to do with when do you do the Mac? There's those whole different protocols of things, you know, which have done it different ways. And like, you know, do you do, you do the Mac before you encrypt the actual message? And they've can't find out that get the ciphertext first, then you actually do the Mac on that. <laughs> okay, that's back in symmetric land, which could be relevant to symmetric encryption. But Sorry, this is where I'm completely off on it. <laughs> no, that's fine. Uh, that, that's very important. So... The best example I can give of, uh, you know, you have normal encryption where you have a key, you have a message, and you get a ciphertext of the same length. They're slightly longer depending on padding and the construction used. And, you know, the, you encrypt, you send your ciphertext, only the key can decrypt it. But, and there should be a giant asterisk on that, if somebody over the wire records the ciphertext and keeps replaying it by and making alterations, for example, uh, Vodney's attack, which was exploited something called a pattern oracle. You can actually decrypt um, ciphertext one byte at a time without knowing the key. If you have an active oracle, which is basically a network port you can send ciphertext to, and if you detect an error, then you know that you know the message failed. But if you get a, you know, if it's, it comes out of the back as garbage, then or you know it takes longer for it to fail, then it's like okay, well the padding error didn't happen, so there must have been something else going on there. Uh, you can actually use any real information link and say, oh okay, so. That was a valid message, and then you keep going on and on. And with CBC mode, you can the way it's uh, cipher blockchaining, it's constructed as it takes the uh, previous block um, or the initialization vector, and it does an exclusive or with the current block uh, and treats that as the plain text. So if you can flip bits in the previous block, uh, the cipher text, you can control what's being exclusively or with the plain text. So if you get a padding error, you can deduce, okay, well, you know, if it's following PKCS seven padding, which is if you have three bytes left over, you take the binary three, which is O three O three O three, and you put that in those spaces. And then, if you have three of them, or if you have a three in the last spot, you expect three of those three bytes. Um, 
and you'll never have zero. Uh, if you have a complete full block, you'll end up with a full block of just, you know, OFs uh, and hex representation. Oh, that's really interesting. And uh, that's actually one thing you've released is something called Easy RSA. Uh, and would you mind just going into a little bit there, like kind of how that came about, the reasoning behind it? I know you're saying like the process of the like, colors and everything, you know, how does the RSA and DSA algorithms differ? Um, okay, RSA, DSA is a little bit into the woods of different constructions, but uh, Easy RSA was created to uh, address deficit um, I found two years ago in the PHP community. If you're familiar with the Zend framework at all, uh, you might remember the 2015 update to their cryptography library um, that completely like, made all their RSA, RSA stuff incompatible. Uh, they were using an old padding mode called PKCS1, which, if you use the OpenSSL uh, private decrypt function, is the default padding mode. Um, this is vulnerable to a different kind of padding oracle attack that involves multiplying the ciphertext, not doing an exclusive or. Uh, there was discovered by a now Google employee uh, named Daniel Bleichenbacher in 1998. This was called the million message attack at the time. And with this, you could... Um, basically replay a ciphertext containing the pre-master secret, uh, send it to a server from, you know, like do, do a fake SSL handshake. And after about a million of these, you can decrypt the pre-master secret and you can spy on the SSL session that you've probably been recording in the background the entire time and decrypt all of the traffic. So this actually broke SSL version two and three. Hence why we should not be using SSL two and three and uh, using now a TLS 1.2. Exactly. Um, we thought the Bleichenbacher uh, attack was dead. Like we thought, okay, you know, nobody's going to be using something that's vulnerable to a 1998 attack anymore. But then in 2015, I looked at Zen Framework and found out that they were. I looked around at a lot of the other PHP software and saw that a lot of people use OpenSSL for their RSA encryption and decryption, and nobody specifies OAEP padding, which stands for uh, Optimal Asymmetric Encryption Padding, which doesn't have these, you know, padding and oracle vulnerabilities or anything like that. There's actually a lot of ways to screw RSA up. Um, and that's why you shouldn't do it yourself. <laughs> exactly. If you set your uh, public exponent too low and your messages sort, you can actually just divide the ciphertext by three or take the cube root of your ciphertext and you get your plain text. Uh, that's why we have padding modes because textbook RSA, you can just do that. Take the cube root of the message. You've decrypted it. Congratulations. You don't have to go any further. <laughs> And it's because if the message is too short to wrap the modulus, it's literally just cubed. Uh, there's some other attacks, including Coppersmith attack. There was another one, Bleichenbacher in 1998 published this one against encryption. If your public exponent is three, even if you're using you know a padding mode that doesn't have that wrapping issue, you can actually forge messages using his 2006 attack. So there is a lot of literature on RSA attacks, um, including factoring attacks that are getting faster and faster every year. So do you reckon our RSA is secure still to use, or do you think there's alternatives that are better to use? Uh, <laughs> I'm not confident in the long-term security of RSA. It's probably fine for the meantime. If you have like an SSL certificate that uses RSA 2048, but it's going to expire before 2030, you're probably fine. Uh, I would expect everything to start moving towards elliptic curve cryptography in the next few years, uh, probably ECDSA over one of the NIST curves, but in more medium-term future towards something like what Libsodium offers, which is the curve 25519 algorithms, which are now, I think, available in TLS 1.3. That was the motivation behind EZRSA. What EZRSA does is it combines authenticated encryption, uh, which is encryption with a MAC, which is a message authentication code, and all that means uh, for most people is that that whole uh, bit flipping attack to decrypt messages one at a time uh, is not possible unless you have the key, in which case you don't need to do an active attack. So circa 2000, a, I think it was Rogaway, published a formal security proof for why authentication, authenticated encryption is necessary. And also that the specific instruction that needed to be done was called encrypt then Mac. And how this works is that you take a key hash function construction, like HMAC, which hashes your message and then hashes it with a key uh, using padding um, specific byte patterns that are the size of the uh, hash function or, or the message. And what it would do is first it would encrypt the message. Like let's say you're using CBC mode. You would first um, you know, encrypt your messages normally with a random initialization vector, hopefully from Debian random. 
Um, if you're using something weird like RAND, uh, switch that first. So you have your random, you know, 16 byte uh, initialization vector. You have your AES CBC encrypted message. And then you would take both of those things, and this is important that you get both of those things. Uh, I made that mistake once, and I got a really embarrassing email from somebody who says, hey, I can control the first 16 bytes of your message freely. <laughs> uh, and you'll pass them into a uh, HMAC function. Uh, you could do like a hash in it, or you could do it all in one line with a hash underscore HMAC. Uh, with a secure hash function like SHA-256 of the initialization vector and the message, and you'll get a, a hash that authenticates those two messages with a key. And you take that key and you stick it on the end, and when you get a message, the first thing you do is you grab the message authentication code, which should be the last 32 bytes of the message. And if the message is less than 32 bytes long, uh, like, fail immediately. And then you grab the rest of the message, and you know the key, you know, because that's shared, because you're using symmetric encryption. Recalculate the message authentication code of the IV and ciphertext you were just given. Compare them using a function like hash equals in constant time. If they don't match, stop what you're doing, throw an exception, you know, either catch it somewhere else or just let it kill the script. And like, just full stop. Don't don't proceed. You know, somebody's doing something evil, and just don't let it happen. And then, if that, you know, if everything's all fine and well, then decrypt as normally. So that's interesting because that so the authenticated encryption then provides you with two kind of strengths there. Where you so you're encrypting it, so making sure that you can see it, the people who actually have the key, and then also ensuring that no one's tampering with it in between. Yep, it's uh, it's the best of both worlds. Yep, it should be indis- the ciphertext should be indistinguishable from random noise. That's why you use the random initialization vector and a strong cipher, and it should also be resistant to what's called uh, chosen ciphertext attacks. Because, you know, security people love their acronyms. This is abbreviated as IND-CCA2. So when a construction follows an authenticated encryption scheme, such as AES, CBC mode with HMAC, you know, SHA-256, or if you want to be really fancy in your auth USB 7.1, you can use AES GCM uh, directly from OpenSSL and not need to bother figuring out how to do the whole encrypt MAC construction. It has a property they call IND-CCA3, which just means authenticated encryption rather than just you know, somehow resistant to these attacks. So what EasyRSA does is it uses uh, Taylor Hornby, Diffuse Security, whichever one you know him by. He wrote a uh, cryptography library to do simple string encryption in PHP. And this uses version 2 of that for symmetric encryption. And then for uh, doing public key cryptography, you have your public key and your private key. It actually does something called uh, KEMDEM, K-E-M plus D-E-M, which... In the beginning of uh, this talk, we uh, mentioned, you know, you separate your uh, AES encryption from your RSA encryption. This is kind of like that, where you encrypt your key with your message, you know, with your public key, and then they can decrypt it. Uh, it does it actually a little bit inverted. It uses the uh, ciphertext itself and the message uh, the, as in, in an HMAC construction. And the reason is because if there's some weird attack discovered against OAEP uh, padding, let's say another weird padding oracle or some other kind of esoteric attack that breaks the security guarantees of OAEP. This actually sidesteps that because you need to have the ciphertext and the uh, plain text of that message, and then you HMAC them together to get the key that's used to decrypt instead of just encrypting it directly. It seems a little bit backwards, but all that does is make sure that if some weird you know, edge case happens and this is not actually a secure construction, like the padding mode for RSA, it doesn't actually influence anything. You can't decrypt the key and detect it because it's not using the message that it decrypts. It's literally, it grabs the data that's there, mixes it in with HMAC and gets another key that's completely, you know, it's deterministic if you know both pieces. But it's a, it's a step of indirection that makes it really hard to get any useful information out of it, even if you can break the, uh, constr- break the protocol that's being used. Um, the other thing for signatures, it just uses uh, PSS mode instead of PKCS1, just in case, you know, Somebody figures out a way to use uh, Coppersmith's attack or Blankenbacher's attack against uh, a public exponent of 65537. I don't know how you remember this off the top of your head. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I work with this stuff a lot. Uh, most of the stuff I do isn't public, but I try to publish, publish whatever I can. That's amazing. And, and also then with the authentic encryption, there's another side to it. You can actually add associated data um, with that. Well, what does that actually entail? So this is really cool for, like, you have a password storage where you use, like, bcrypt to, pass, to hash people's passwords. And then you encrypt it with a key that the database does not know. Like, it's, you have your web server and your database on separate bare metal, and they communicate over a local network. And the database server, which is running, you know, code from, like, different websites, and one of them might have a SQL injection, 
it, it has its own distinct file system. It can't access the web server's file system. You're encrypting it to where you have only ciphertext stored in the database. And if you manage to decrypt the ciphertext, all you get is password hashes, but you want that extra layer of protection. Well, there's still an attack you can do if you're trying to break into somebody's account. Um, let's say you're trying to access an admin account. You would use SQL injection to update their encrypted password hash with the one for your account, one you would know, and then you just log in as them using your password and it would work. So what you can do with authenticated encryption with associated data, remember how I said, you know, um, diffuses library and authenticated encryption generally, you encrypt a message and then you do a authentication tag, you know, HMAC over the ciphertext. All this does is take whatever associated data and include that in that authentication tag uh, calculation. So it'd be like um, in the first example, when I said to do the HMAC over the IV and the ciphertext, your IV is technically your associated data. Protocols generally give you a space, uh, a space where you can supply your own arbitrary data, like uh, a TCP you know, sequence number, or in the case of a password hashing thing, the user ID number, their database row ID. So if you were to use authenticated encryption with associated data, or AED as it's abbreviated online, and you use the user ID or the username or both or, you know, whatever, and, you know, somebody tried to replace their password hash with another one, it would just fail to decrypt. You get to, you know, recalculate the authentication tag with the wrong authenticated or with the wrong associated data, and therefore it would just fail before it got to the decryption stage. So it's... That's a specific use case for it. Um, the general idea is that you might have situations where you don't want to encrypt anything. You just want to authenticate some data, and you want to use one true protocol for both cases. You know, the general case that most people envision is you want to encrypt something and have nothing be public. And in those cases, you would just have you know authenticated encryption, and your associated data would be like empty string. Uh, so an AEAD. You know, authenticated as encryption with associated data construction covers both use cases. I wrote a library, it's called uh, Pasetto, and originally called POST, and it was proposed as an alternative to JSON web tokens. And one of the earlier designs uh, had a separate, you know, authentication and then encryption for symmetric key, where you would have, like, you know, if I want to have an authenticated token where everything's public versus an, encryption to an encrypted token where you, everything is encrypted. Those two have been kind of combined into an AEAD use case now, where you have a uh, space for your, your message that's encrypted, and then you have a, a footer, which can be any arbitrary data that's completely public. So if you wanted to have like a key identifier, you could use that, make that public, and then you could grab the footer off of it, go, okay, well, this is, you know, key number, and then whatever the UID is, I do associate with that is, uh, grab the correct key, then decrypt it all in one step without having to build a complicated protocol on top of that. And... It's a good building block for like if you if you're trying to build something that uses encryption and you're not using an AEAD mode, you're probably either limiting yourself or you're making a horrible mistake security wise. That's so interesting. That's so cool. And it's rewinding a little bit. So you did mention um, the kind of secret key exchange in like I think it was the asymmetric case where you know we have private public key encryption. It'd be really interesting to know about kind of the idea of secret key exchange in a symmetric world. There's something that people probably have heard about. It's like Diffie-Hellman. So I'm just wondering, could you maybe explain Diffie-Hellman and exactly like how that process works? Sure. So Diffie-Hellman was a uh, protocol device in the late 70s. The idea is that you want to, you know, somebody's public key. This could be something tied to like their address or to some, you know, something stored on DNS. But it's something that's completely public. And you want to send a secret to them over an untrusted channel. Uh, something where, you know... Um, the, Not the internet. <laughs> yeah, the internet's a good example. A uh, public Wi-Fi is another example. So the idea is that the attacker who's observing the network traffic can see their public key, and they can see your public key. How can you send data to where, no matter how much of the public information you slurp up, you can't just decrypt all the future messages? It's for secret information exchange over an untrusted channel. And the classic word method looks something like this. You would both decide on a base point. This two, three, and five were the common examples cited, but two is the most common. And you, you generate a very large number. You take this number, and this is called your secret key. And you would take two to the secret key power, mod a very large prime. They're standard primes for like prime numbers. Like um, I don't have this one memorized, but it's in. <laughs> I would be impressed if you did. <laughs> <laughs> it's a. Uh, I do know his identifier is 2048-bit group number 14. It's a standard prime number to use. 
Uh, I don't remember the exact hex sequence because uh, that's a bit much. <laughs> so what this, so the idea is that you take a number, uh, you put in the exponent of a uh, small prime, like 2, 3, or 5, and then you would take it and model arts prime. And this creates a trapdoor function. What is a trap? Sorry, what is a trapdoor function? A trapdoor function is a function that's very easy to calculate one way, but very hard to reverse. Uh, hash functions are trapdoor functions. In order to break Diffie-Hellman, you would need to uh, solve something called the discrete logarithm problem, which is somewhat related to the uh, security problems that, that affect RSA, which involves factoring large numbers, you know, getting the prime factors. RSA is based on having two prime numbers that you multiply together, and that becomes your public key. Um, Diffie-Hellman, you, your public key is 2 to the nth power mod p, where n is your secret key. And you would call that, like, capital N, like big N. And usually, you know, they substitute with A and B for Alice and Bob. And in order to do a key exchange, all you do is you send your, you know, Alice will send her big A to Bob. Bob will send his big A to Alice, or his big B to Alice. Alice has little A, Bob has you know, little B. And what you would do is then, instead of just taking your, you know, 2 to the uh, A power, you know, little A, you would take 2 to the little A capital B, and then you would take, uh, Bob would take uh, 2 to the... Uh, little b capital a and make them both mod n or mod p excuse me so what ends up happening is that because of the uh multiplicative properties there two to the you know a capital b and two to the b capital a mod a's constant prime number is going to result in the same secret and you're just hiding it kind of in plain view Yep, you're using math it's crazy so cool and then you have elliptic curve diffie hellman which uses instead of you know large numbers, you know, 2 to the n mod p, you're taking a base point. In the example I always point people to, it would be 9. And you're adding that base point to itself a certain number of times. So you get a multiplication. So instead of, you know, 2 to the n mod p, and the base point's usually called g, you have n times g over an elliptic curve, which is a mathematical uh, finite field over a, um, with a large prime number like 2 to the 255 minus 19. Or um, I don't have the P256 one that NIST uses for their uh, ECDSA and uh, elliptic curve diffie hellman algorithms, but it's also a large prime somewhere in the vicinity of 2 to the 256. Because there's a couple of elliptic curves you can choose from, isn't there? Yep, there's different... Um, not only are there different like, curves like in terms of prime numbers and parameters, there's different curve formulas. Um, you have Weierstrass curves, Koblitz curves, uh, Montgomery curves, Edwards curves, twisted Edwards curves, and the list goes on and on. Because <laughs> people are worried about some of them, aren't there? There is some kind of, there's always this a case, I'm sure, that people don't trust certain things. Yeah. Um, so when it comes to elliptic curve cryptography, especially for doing like Diffie-Hellman, this is also true of signatures, but most people talk about in the Diffie-Hellman use case, you have uh, what's called an invalid subgroup attack. So it looks kind of like this. You have an equation like y squared equals x cubed plus ab plus some constant. That's your elliptic curve equation. Uh, that's called a Weierstrass curve. You know, your public key and your private key are both points on this curve, x, y. And when you, you know, calculate a, something over a message, you have a point that you give them. That's your signature. And if you pass, you know, a public key that's an x, y, and they plug it into the curve equation... You know, the idea is that you get, you know, you can do something similar to the Diffie-Hellman where you're doing exponentiation and then modulo reducing the, the result. When you send somebody an XY pair and, you know, you have the correct X value, but the Y is on a smaller curve, what you end up doing is that you leak information about their secret when they perform the calculation blindly. And you can use something called the Chinese remainder theorem with several iterations of this attack and different invalid curves to leak different bits of the key. You send 20 fake public key exchanges and you steal their private key and now you can impersonate them or you can decrypt any message sent to them. Uh, that's the problem with wire stress curves and that's what P256 uses. And the response to you know these invalid curve attacks against uh, elliptic curve Diffie-Hellman was, well, the implementer should know that and should do it correctly. And you know they should you know make sure that the point they receive is on the curve and have all these you know validation steps to which uh, the guy who wrote two, Curve 5519 said, that's irresponsible. The standard should be designed to resist these attacks. And he proposed his alternative, which is what you know, Curve 5519 uses, which is called the Montgomery Ladder, where instead of you know, having all this X, Y pairs you know, in coordinates being passed back and forth, you send an X coordinate, and that's it. Your public key is an X, you know, an X 
the result of a uh, scalar multiplication. That's strong enough. Yeah, if you have the x coordinate, you don't need to send the y. You can calculate that from the curve. And then you have uh, Edwards curves, which uh, Lipsodium uses for signatures. You can actually use Edwards for both Diffie-Hellman and uh, elliptic curve uh, DSA, sort of. Uh, they call it Ed DSA to differentiate it from ECDSA because uh, Edwards curves allow you to do a lot of the same uh, security benefits of Montgomery curves. And they're actually birationally equivalent to each other, which means if you have a an ed25519 secret, you can actually convert it into a curve 23519 secret for public key to Hellman. There's a lot of cool stuff you can do there. And, and it'd be interesting to know kind of, you know, why would you use elliptic curve cryptography over, say, what you would use in a standard Diffie-Hellman trans- uh, exchange? Uh, the biggest reason is if you have a trusted implementation like Lipsodium or Golang provides its own standard libraries in the uh, crypto extension, you can guarantee, you know, not only are they free of invalid curve attacks, but also that they're constant time operations. And there's a lot less levers to pull, like with elliptic curve cryptography. If you have, you know, 256, uh, you know, P256, uh, the NIST curve, or if you're doing, you know, digital signatures and you're using like the Koblitz curve or you're using ED25519, you have your algorithm and you have your message and you have your key pairs and that's it. There's no knobs and levers. You don't have to choose your public exponent size. You don't have to specify a padding mode. You know, there's no magic you have to master to use it securely. It's, it's pretty boring. You have your algorithm. You know, a function, you pass in your message and your secret key, and you get a signature. So, you know, to verify, you have your signature, your message, and a public key, and you get true or false. And that's it. Well, boring security is the good security, though, isn't it? (laughs) Definitely. So that's where cryptography has been going. Is it also because the security you gain from just like a smaller, you know, in bits, if you're just looking at bits and bytes from an elliptic curve cryptography compared to, say, the Diffie-Hellman one? So it's an actual size and actual computation strength as well. Oh, yeah. Uh, the key sizes are much smaller. Uh, have you ever heard of DNS crypt? Uh, no. What's DNS crypt? DNS crypt was an early protocol for using Diffie-Hellman to encrypt DNS lookups. And it would actually, for the DNS server, it would put its public key in the uh, subdomain. And they would base32 encode it, and it came out to be about 51 characters long. So you could have, you know, um, it started with the char- magic characters UZ5, and then you'd have your public key, and it'd be like dot name dot com, and that would be your DNS crypt, you know, server, your name server. So when you have the software that speaks the protocol, it would connect to that. It would use the subdomain as your public key, and then all your DNS record requests would be encrypted between you and the server you're trusting to handle DNS for you. Because that that's actually one interesting thing. Because last episode we did talk about you know HTTPS, TLS, you know HTTP over TLS and things like that. And you know we assume then we use that and communication with the server is hidden. But actually these headers, such as like DNS requests and things that we're actually doing, is leaked out. Uh, there isn't actually any. They are plain text, aren't they? Yep. And there's you know protocols like DNSSEC that are being proposed that do nothing about uh, the actual encryption. DNSSEC is a uh, most cryptographers don't like DNSSEC because it uses uh, old RSA encryption. Uh, I think there's still t- t- 1024-bit signatures all throughout the uh, zone records. And it's only about signing records. Like you sign uh, a message using a digital signature algorithm saying that these these host names have these IP addresses. And it recursively goes back to like .com and .org and .net. And there was a uh, proposal to use DNSSEC to replace the certificate authority infrastructure called Dane that was being pushed by the U.S. government, which is really dubious since they could theoretically control the keys for .com because that's owned by VeriSign. So a lot of people are very skeptical of DNSSEC, not only for protocol design reasons, but also political reasons. My biggest complaint with it is it doesn't solve the privacy issue. If I um, I'm, if I'm listening to port fifty three at Comcast, I can see everybody you know. Oh well, the person at this IP address is looking for you know YouTube.com, but this person is looking for you know insert porn site here. And and that leaks a lot of information that people don't. I think people don't understand that that is actually getting leaked as well with TLS. You know HTTP over TLS. Yeah, it will hide what you're saying, but it won't hide who you're speaking to. The best way to hide who you're speaking to today is to use Tor. That's a whole other topic, onion networking and routing. <laughs> um, and if you're going to use Tor, either run a non-exit node, so you have traffic constantly coming in and out, or always use it. You know, if 
if you're using normal internet traffic, like you're just using, you know, Comcast or Verizon or whoever your internet provider is, and you, yeah, your website speak HTTPS, but you're always speaking to them directly, and then you want to do something sensitive, like you want to talk to that person overseas who's, you know, a dissident who needs help, or if you're doing something questionable, or you just want to talk to somebody who's very paranoid and they won't speak to you unless you're talking to Tor, suddenly, you know, you have a baseline of very low noise signal, then suddenly you participate in an activity that's very noisy. It, it stands out. You're not, it's more needle, less haystack. If you're going to use Tor, I recommend, like, constantly having haystack. Otherwise, people will go, okay, well, that's suspicious. If you're in a country where Tor usage is either not encouraged or outright illegal, using it only in those moments is going to draw a lot of attention to you, especially if, you know, there was just a failed coup six months ago, and then suddenly you start using Tor and you're in the military. Uh, they're going to immediately look at you. They're probably going to bug your computer like within 24 hours, depending on where you live. Scary, scary stuff. And I, I'd, li- I'd like to back up even more, and I'm sorry about this, Scott. This is going to be like new cryptography 101. Uh, but for me, and it'd be really interesting, and this is probably math 101 as well, Like, why are primes so important to cryptography? And the simplest answer I can give you is because they're prime numbers. You can't divide them by a smaller number. You have to know the large number, which is distinct and indivisible by other integers. Uh, to figure out the secrets, or it's over a prime field, um, so you get an even distribution. So the probability isn't skewed in favor of like even numbers or numbers less than 10. Most cryptography relies on discrete mathematics, which works over integers over finite fields, uh, generally speaking. There, some of the post-quantum stuff doesn't use finite fields. A finite field could be something like, you know, uh, all the hour numbers on a clock from 0 to 11. And that's a finite field of 12. You know, if you hit 12, you wrap back down to zero, you do a modulus. You know, if you have a, a clock with over field seven, and you start with the numbers zero through seven, you go through, you know, zero through six, you go back to zero. Okay, now let's say you multiply the number three throughout that. You go from three to six to nine, which reduces back to two. And you'll go and hit every number on the clock in a, you know, it's by three, but seemingly random order before you get back to the first one. That's why prime numbers are so important is because they don't divide each other. And because if you have a random number, if there's no, you know, oh, it's a small number, you know, to look at a small place, it's actually pretty evenly scattered throughout it. It's pseudo randomly distributed, but evenly. And it's that not having that bias that helps it. Yeah, because if you know, you know, okay, well, they generated a random number and it's not a really small one. So you're going to look in the upper bits of the spectrum. That lets you do a cryptanalysis that cuts down, you know, okay, we can shave off the top 50% of possibilities just on that alone. You know, your attack space becomes smaller and smaller. And then if you know, you know, it's within 2 to the 64 and 2 to the 65 it, it are the values. It's not anything higher. It's not anything lower. Yeah, you still have to search through 2 to the 64 operations to find the key. But that's a lot easier to attack than, two, you know, 2 to the 128. Because each time you increase your attack size, you double the amount of cost you have to uh, expend in terms of energy and time. Another thing, actually, and, and this is kind of me kind of hypothesizing about something. Like, so it's say man in the middle attacks, so for stuff like private key encryption. Say hypothetically, you know, we've got Alice and Bob, good old Alice and Bob, and you know they've both got their public keys that are available. If I put someone in uh, the middle of this, and I was essentially kind of, I was able to tell Bob, actually, no, your uh, Alice's private key is whatever private key, or, uh, sorry, Alice's public key is whatever my public key is. And I essentially was able to kind of, you know, replay this traffic between them, essentially doing the man in the middle attack. How can I, as Alice and Bob, ensure kind of talking to one another without actually, you know, going to say, look, this is my public key and, and showing it maybe in real life or another way of verifying? Is there a way actually within like these protocols to actually verify like that using the, the authentication route? Uh, okay, welcome to public key infrastructure, PKI. It is a massive field in security, and it involves basically answering that question of how do we know which public key to use. Um, The current standard that secures the internet is called X509, which is basically certificate authorities. These are public keys that ship with your browser and operating system of known authorities who can in turn sign other, you know, public keys for websites. And there's usually a, you know, a, a chain. You have your, you have your CA cert that's, held by the company that's good till 2030. Then you have their intermediary ones, which are the ones they generate, you know, every so often. And those intermediary ones are the ones used to sign certificates for their actual customers. 
So when you, uh, let's say, get a certificate from Let's Encrypt, you're, it's signed by one of Let's Encrypt's in intermediary certificates. It's not signed by their global one. That's used only to sign intermediaries. Is this so they can then easily revoke certificates and things like that if something happens it's supposed to you know going with just the root one exactly so the idea is that if you know one of the five or ten intermediary certificates for semantic is compromised they can distrust any certificate signed with that intermediary certificate after a certain date have their customers who had one legitimately you know get a reissue from a different intermediary and they don't have to completely replace the chain and update all the software in the world it's just oh an intermediary got compromised okay let's swap that one out and it's signed by the root, you know, master one for that CA, which is in turn that publicly ships with your OS. It's a way of avoiding the inevitability of a compromise. That is awesome. And actually, interestingly, and I don't know whether, you know, it's something we can go into, but there was actually an attack on Let's Encrypt, well, on the way that the ACME standard worked. I think it was the, one of the ACME protocols. Yep. Um, so if you were on shared hosting and you use Let's Encrypt, Somebody else on the same server could impersonate your Let's Encrypt challenge and generate a certificate for you. But if you're on uh, shared hosting, I mean, you're kind of in bed with unknown people, uh, possibly hundreds of them. There's no telling whether, what other kind of hacks they could do. If you ha- are doing encryption on a website on a shared hosting, and like let's say uh, one of the system administrators accidentally makes something uh, world-readable by the Apache user, you can build a web uh, script that just reads everybody's encryption keys and then decrypt everything. <laughs> There's a lot of room for error there. Um, generally speaking, uh, dedicated servers are more secure than virtual machines because, as we've seen with stuff like Spectre and Meltdown, a whole set of literature about uh, cross VM attacks using side channels for uh, you know decades at this point. VMs are good, but they're not like the gold standard if you're trying to be secure. And then shared hosting is like a step down from VMs. If you're okay with the risk of side channel attacks and you're not worried about being targeted by a nation state, they're fine. Uh, they're cheap. They're pretty good for like uh, bootstrapping a you know a new startup or a new uh, software project. But if you want to be secure, get a dedicated server. And if you want to go the extra mile, get two of them, put them next to each other, and put your database on one and your web server on the other. And that way, you can actually encrypt password hashes and whatnot without it being basically unnecessary waste of CPU cycles. Because if you can get to the database, you can escape to the file system with ninety mm, percent certainty. Uh, I've had a lot of good luck whenever I've had to test a system to do that. And I find SQL injection is pretty much game over. And like we spoke like that last time, yeah, SQL injection. And it's interesting because I'm guessing VM kind of exploits then are a hot commodity. Uh, it would be if it wasn't for the fact, okay, uh, if we're talking about like uh, a VM, like hypervisor break, uh, something that breaks like a Zen VM, it allows you to break into the hypervisor and then read other memory from other virtual machines. That would be really useful if people actually updated and restarted their hypervisor ever. Uh, most people don't do that. And I ran into that when I worked at a, a university in Florida where I reported an issue trying to upgrade from Debian Squeeze to Wheezy to give you an idea of how many years ago that was. And the file system driver used uh, on their uh, hypervisor, which was uh, Zen, and the file system used by you know Debian Wheezy, they were incompatible. So whenever I upgraded it, I took a production system offline for three days uh, while people were trying to register for an event uh, at a teacher training. So that was a lot of fun. <laughs> oh, I heard you. I'm sure you got lots of screaming there. Uh, yeah, it took one of the uh, university uh, like sysadmins, one of the you know ops specialists, uh, two and a half days to figure out what the problem was because th- this was something that wasn't documented. And then I found out afterwards, because I had gotten in contact with them and the university's uh, SIRT, which is a security incident response team. And I told them, hey, you know, uh, I'm having a bug with this, you know, a while later. Have you guys run the latest Zen updates? You know, I know they're, the bug is kind of related to a security issue. And I, the response I got back from their, like, head system person was, we haven't run any updates with, like, two exclamation points. Like, she was panicking. Oh dear! <laughs> Keeping up to date—that yeah. that really is kind of the, the golden rule, isn't it? It is, and it, it burns people so many times. Actually, moving on from that, then a uh, completely different topic, but around the, the authentication route, kind of nonetheless. The the idea of multi-factor authentication—a lot of people know this now. Two FA, how important it is adding that extra layer, something you know, something you have. Multi-factor is kind of that's kind of the broader sense of it. I was wondering, kind of like. What is multi-factor authentication and what does it actually provide? 
Um, so the idea behind authentication is you have your baseline, you know, username and password. That's who you are is your username. That's an identifier. That's public. Uh, your password is supposed to be something that only you know. That's pretty self-explanatory. And like you said, um, the other idea, the idea behind multi-factor is that there's other factors. Not if somebody figures out your secret, they can't impersonate you. You have you know different approaches. It's you know what you have, like a hardware token or like a secret possessed on like a like a secret key that's stored on an Android device that uh, is used with an algorithm like uh, HOTP or TOTP. And then you have other things like biometric authentication, but to make that long and short, biometrics are identifiers, not secrets. That should be used as a username for highest sensitive access, not as a password, because they can be spoofed. Fingerprints are like, you know, they're not exactly that hard to spoof, are they? No, and they're also not that hard to steal, considering, you know, you leave them everywhere you go. Like if you uh, drink uh, from a glass at a restaurant, the waitress, when they take your cup away, they refill it, could just lift your fingerprint off of it. Boom, they've got all five fingerprints, most likely. Unless you're drinking tea from a teacup, in which case... <laughs> then they'll, they'll provide it in a glass, and you're like, this is very odd. It's like, no, we don't need all your fingerprints. <laughs> Would you like a cup of water with that? Here, I insist. <laughs> yeah. Please, please do. Uh, but yeah, focusing then on, like, on the possession side of that. So you did mention TOTP and HOTP, and I think those are the ones that people are more, the most familiar with. Uh, you know, this idea that you get these one-time passwords, whether it's through SMS, which it has its own vulnerabilities, definitely, or through like apps, you know, like you have Authy and Google Authenticator and things like that. And in fact, actually, you've made a, a multi-factor application or a, sorry, package, you know, PHP package. You know, would it would be great maybe to go into these different, you know, different ways of actually making these one-time passwords and how they actually get yeah, come about? Sure. Uh, so earlier I mentioned the HMAC algorithm that's used for authenticating ciphertext, you know, for encrypt, you know, authenticated encryption. Uh, HMAC by itself is actually used in a lot of protocols, and it's actually used in HOTP and TOTP. With your, uh, you have a secret key, which is what's actually stored on your device when you scan a QR code, uh, or it's stored locally and it's used with your account information to generate a message that's sent over SMS. Uh, I don't trust SMS-based two-factor, two-factor authentication. You can build an IMSI catcher for, I think, 50 bucks with commodity hardware. You can get it like um, Amazon.com or Newegg. That's really scary, isn't yeah. it? Technically, they're illegal to uh, operate, but they're not illegal to build our own. Um, it, so what would that do then in the case of iMessager then? So it would just sniff out... It'll pick up, that uh, pick up any text messages sent uh, over the air. And you can use that to... If you know the phone number that's being sent to you, which is included in the information of the SMS message, you can just read anything that's sent to and from a phone. And so because SMSs then fundamentally as well, they are plain text. Yes, they are. <laughs> and again, we're, pr- we're trying to use, say, like this one-time password in plain text, such as like email again is another thing that's plain text, which people probably aren't fully aware of. Yeah. Um, even if your uh, server accepts encryption, if I'm doing an active attack, I can just drop the encryption. It's opportunistic. Uh, SMTP, which is used to send emails to servers, it defaults to plain text. And actually, you'll start with a, you know, the EHLO or ELHO. Or, it's a weird way of saying hello. It does all this before it begins SSL. It, it actually runs a start SSL command. And if you strip that, or you return a fake error code and then strip it on the other side of the wire, it'll just go, oh, okay, you don't speak SSL. Well, here's the message I'm trying to email. That's insane. Why would why would it do that? Is it just because of the fact of ease of the fact it needs to carry on working? Uh, legacy systems, systems that didn't support SSL years ago, and they wanted to not break the internet when people trying to email. Uh, don't use email or SMS for anything sensitive, uh, like ever. If you wanted to use and like send a message to a friend that contains like a password or something, uh, either have a s- password manager like a team one like one password and just use that, which is the tool intended for the job. But if you don't have that already in place, make sure that everybody you communicate with is using something like Signal, which is an Android app that is like SMS but encrypted. Is what would you put what WhatsApp in there as well with end-to-end encryption, or is there yeah the dubious around that as well? The fears over WhatsApp are mostly that it's owned by Facebook, and Facebook might figure out okay, well this person is in contact with this person, and might use that for uh, ad targeting. That's the only real legitimate fear of WhatsApp. People say things like, oh well, you know there was that one vulnerability in the Guardian article, but they made a trade-off that I personally wouldn't have made, but I understand why they did. Uh, They have over a billion users all over the world. Most of them don't know what encryption is. 
and you know a lot of people in especially you know third world countries as we would call them uh most people share the same phone they just swap out their sim card so every time a swim card the sim card gets swapped out your encryption key is going to rotate instead of breaking it for all those users and making it to where you know they don't want to use whatsapp they want to use unencrypted sms they just decided to make a fair trade-off for usability and make it say unless you enable notifications to just roll over your key and people you know there are cryptographers who will say that's not a good design and I will say, yeah, but considering the operating environment, they have to make it work in. They're making encryption there seamless. People don't know that they, they're actually using encryption and how secure actually it is compared to, say, using an SMS or an email. Yeah, and I think we should definitely make that the norm. You know, people should be more secure than they realize because right now people are more vulnerable than they realize. WhatsApp, Signal, or they're both good. There's other contenders coming up like Omemo for uh, XMPP. Uh, Wire, I think, is another good one. There's contenders coming up, but Signal and WhatsApp were, you know, used the Signal protocol, and they were the forerunners. And they're still recommended by cryptographers to this day. So if you hear anybody spreading, you know, fear about WhatsApp and they link to that Guardian article, just look up the rebuttal by basically every cryptographer and every cryptography expert that isn't really a cryptographer, like they don't hold a PhD, um, on the internet. Like there was like something like 60 or something signatures, like the day it was drafted and it just kept going and going. They, uh, about seven months later, published a, uh, you know, a very milquetoast rebuttal of their own article and asked for comments but they have been receiving a flood of comments for months, including passive-aggressive uh, Twitter messages from Pinboard. So, yeah, you have your secret that's stored on your device, hopefully. Uh, if you're doing SMS-based authentication, hopefully, you know, uh, I think um, Carnage is a screen name. I can't remember people's names very well online or uh, in real time. Um, his Twitter account is, like, Just Give Up or something like that. He does a lot of the uh, speaking in the UK area about cryptography. And he said he was going to write a uh, library that integrates with Signal to, for like two-factor authentication for people who are used to the SMS usability. But it would, it would only work with Signal and they'd have to have Signal on their phone. That's really useful. I mean, that would then, I suppose, then you've got the app on the phone, haven't you? Which then you could just say, go with Authy or go with one of the others. Yeah. But it does still provide that feel. Exactly. Um, so he's talking about doing that, but so far it doesn't exist. So... If you're using, if you want to use two-factor authentication, you have to use an app currently. That may change in the future, and if it's on Signal, all the you know asterisks about SMS or email authentication can be kind of ignored. It's not super great to rely on you know SMS-based use cases, but people have gotten so used to them that this is secure enough because you're using Signal to send the message. Um, so you're using an app, and you have a six-digit code. Uh, all this is doing in the background is it's taking an HMAC of your secret and the current time of day. There's some weird specifics about how this information is encoded and how it's decoded. For example, your uh, secret is usually when you generate a QR code, it has to be base32 encoded. There's specifics into the internals of it, but it's basically doing an HMAC over a counter. Now, HRTP, it increases every time you authenticate. That can get out of sync very easily. Uh, TOTP is based on the current time of day, usually 30-second or 60-second periods. So that information is usually included in the QR code when you first scan it, so you don't have to sit there and configure everything. And what happens is, is you'll have a six-digit code, which is based on the uh, last like three or four bytes, it could be six to eight digits, of your uh, HMAC output of your secret key and the time. The standard most people use is actually based on SHA-1, but because it's an HMAC uh, construction of SHA-1, and you're only getting the last like three bytes of output at most. You don't have to worry about like severe data leakages. And most, I think, Google Authenticator only supports uh, six-digit numbers to begin with right now. So basically, your HOTP and TOTP is based on HMAC SHA-1 of an increasing number, usually based on the time of day and a secret key. And that's all it is. That's TOTP and HOTP demystified. It is a really clever little scheme, isn't it? And I suppose the only thing there then is that the secret that you, you again, you, you're sharing a secret with that third party, but it's stored on your device. So if the app gets compromised, there has to be things around that, I'm guessing. Um, if the app gets compromised, they have access to your entire phone usually. And if you're access stuff on your phone, they probably have access to your email, which they can uh, do a password reset and bypass everything. That's it. And then exactly the back door there. <laughs> Just the, the forgot my password. That's another thing that might be worth bringing up, uh, password recovery. 
I was going to say, yeah, what's your opinion on password recovery? Because this is another weakness where, and like the idea of security questions and stuff, which no one should put any valid information in the security question. Okay, uh, my standard recommendation um, for when it comes to this in general is uh, use a password manager first and foremost. Uh, one password's good. LastPass is probably okay. There's a lot of attacks published against it, but whatever once gets published, you always hear about them trying to do better and most of the attacks are from people like Tavis Ormandy, who's like a freaking genius when it comes to exploiting software. So it's kind of hard to weigh that against your normal risk of, you know, it's on a sticky note and you're being interviewed by CNN. So it's high resolution on TV that everybody in the world can see. Uh, if you had to ask me which one I would rather do, it'd be an insecure password manager rather than a sticky note on live TV. When it comes to security, uh, making security decisions for yourselves or others, you always have to start with a threat model. For most people's threat model, a password manager like one password or last pass is appropriate. Uh, for anything high sensitive, uh, I use KeyPass uh, internally. I think I mentioned that in one of our previous th uh, conversations. The main reason I say use a password manager is for those security questions. Uh, generate another password and use those as your answers. Don't actually give them your pet's name or the road you were born on or your mother's maiden name or your favorite color or any of those other stupid questions. Like, Don't actually answer them. Now, this might not help if a clever social engineer calls and says, hey, I forgot my password. I'm, I'm so embarrassed. I can't ask my email right now. And they say, okay, well, what was the name of your favorite pet? And they know you do this. And they just say, oh, well, it's it's a bunch of line noise. It looks like garble, you know, like a keyboard mashing. You're not immune to social engineering. So if you're building software and you're thinking about doing password recovery, do not do security questions. Like, don't. It's a bad move. In fact, if you can avoid having a password reset feature, that's in any way automated, If you, I would say avoid it. I realize that most people's business requirements will mandate that it has to be there, especially if you have a support team and you're trying to minimize the number of email tickets you have to deal with on a daily basis. But if you can get away with not having it, don't have it because it is a backdoor into people's accounts. So, you know, okay, well, if you have to, what do you do? Well, the obvious thing to do is to email or SMS or whatever a URL they click on to allow them to reset their password. And, you know, well, okay, well, a lot of sites do that. But there, there's a trick here. Um, I mentioned a long time ago, uh, uh, Remember Me Cookies, I think. Uh, I mentioned in several blog posts, I might have mentioned on the show, about how if you have, like, just a string, um, you know, that's your password reset token, or that's your, you know, Remember Me Cookie and it's just one long random secret that's stored in a database and that's used in a select query, you can actually link information about it through uh, accessing different URLs and seeing how long it takes to fail. There's no practical exploit for this yet, but it's theoretical because search operations are not constant time. So what I recommend people do is something called split tokens, where you take half your key and you store that in the, as, a, uh, as part of the select query in a column, and you either store the rest of it or you take a hash of the second half and you store that in the database. And then when you, uh, you know, you take half your password reset token that's in the URL, like the first 16 out of 32 bytes, uh, and you take that and you do a select query. And you, if you find a record, cool. And then you take a hash function like SHA-256 of the rest of it and compare it with what's in the database. And if it matches, then you've got a valid token. Otherwise, you don't. And if you're using hash equals to compare the hashes, there's no conceivable useful timing leak because even if you get a good valid prefix, you don't learn anything about the rest of the secret. And this might sound like some weird esoteric, like, oh, well, you know, this sounds complicated, but all it's doing is adding a layer of insurance that if you have a single token and you're doing a select query on it, if somebody figures out a way to write a practical timing exploit against like MySQL based on search operations like this, you're not allowing people backdoors into other people's accounts, especially if it's high security like a bank. So... You know, email a random to uh, a random split token to people, and that's probably good enough for uh, password security. The other thing you can do, and this is a uh, most users don't know what GPG is. You know, GNU PG. I was going to ask that actually around email, like that obviously is something an added layer that you can do. Yeah, uh, we wrote a library called GPG Mailer to make it really easy. But if your user has given you their GPG public key, and this is something you can actually do with Facebook. You can encrypt your password reset emails with their PGP public key. And then even if somebody hacks their email accounts, but they don't have their GPG key, which is usually stored on a device that the email server never sees, they can't decrypt the message and log in as them. So I realize most people don't use PGP. There is actually a paper about the usability of it called Why Johnny Can't Encrypt, and then a follow-up paper called Why Johnny Still Can't Encrypt. So I would not mandate it, but if your users... Provide it, that's certainly a good thing to add. Yeah. 
Um, so that's Chief EG Mailer. It, it's under the Paragon IE namespace, like every library you'll hear about me talk about. Oh, I'll definitely put that in the show notes, man. That's awesome. And uh, that uses public key encryption as yep. well, then? Public yep. key encryption. It uses, uh, yeah, it uses RSA currently. Uh, there's an open PGP standard at, uh, amendment. I don't know if it's been passed yet to use uh, basically the same crypto as Libsodium, but most people don't have that yet, so you have to use RSA. Um, and the other thing is that I'm currently building a microservice, kind of like I did with Chronicle, to deploy a uh, form you can generate that does PGP uh, encryption of email messages. So let's so let's say you wanted to um, let's say you're, you're a web design agency and you want your clients to give you their you know SFTP server credentials or something. And, you know, this is a very old school way of doing things, but, you know, we'll forgive that for now. You know, this is real world security where things aren't as good as they could be, but you have to make the best of what you can. So what discretion would do is you would create either a one-time form or you would generate, you know, send them a URL to your long-term form, which would have your branding and everything on it. And, you know, it would be that particular form ID would link to a specific team. And what it would do is that, you know, they paste in their password or whatever and IP address and username and all that. And it would actually encrypt the entire message with every party, everybody in that team's PGP keys individually and then email to them in the background. So they don't have to know about PGP. They can still benefit from it. And if this is served over SSL you know, on your website somewhere or a subdomain of it, and it's in the uh, expect CT, uh, it has an expect CT header, so it's in the certificate transparency database, uh, there's very little attack surface left here. And this doesn't do the Java side, you know, a JavaScript client side encryption, it's all, you know, server side. So if you attack the server, theoretically you could still decrypt everything, but you'd have to be there at the moment that it's encrypted. So if you just play this on your network somewhere, give it a subdomain, use less encrypt to get a you know, certificate, spin it up. Once it's ready to go, you'll be able to just send a URL to a client and suddenly your team has securely received the ciphertext that has the credentials they're trying to send you. And there's none of this, oh I'll just send it over Slack. Or I'll just, you know, send it to you in an email that will probably be intercepted between there and your inbox. Even if even if email's insecure, the uh, the transport layer isn't the last line of defense. There's another layer on top of that. So a common theme that people will hear if they read our blog posts um, at Paragon or if they talk to me individually is security and layers and also separation. I mentioned you know separating databases from web servers and also separating inboxes from the actual keys that can decrypt the messages coming in. There's a you know rule in security where more layers is better, but there's a corollary that multiple speed bumps does not make a wall. So whenever it comes, to, whenever the time comes to build a system, always make sure that you're actually building a wall and not just a speed bump. That's so true, man. So true. And hey, Scott, thank you so much again for coming on the show. It's uh, it's been another great episode. Gone through so many interesting things, loads of stuff to talk about, loads of stuff to investigate more after this episode. So I really appreciate hey, it. Thank you for having me. Awesome. All right, an audience. Well, it's been another great episode and we'll speak to you again next week. Goodbye. You've been listening to Three Devs and a Maybe. You can contact us at contact at three devs and a maybe dot com or follow us on Twitter at the number three devs and a maybe.